And I said, or do I want your brother suing my client and saying, I'm suing you because I lost my buyer because I, you wouldn't conspire to commit fraud with me. I said, hmm, which side of that am I going to take? I said, I'm going to tell my agent to disclose it. If we lose the sale, we lose the sale. You can take the listing somewhere else. We disclosed it, negotiated a $2,000 reduction in the purchase price, Jeez. and they removed their contingencies and closed escrow. Wow. Okay, happy story. Yeah. So the moral to the story is it has to be disclosed. If you have a difficult seller, immediately tell your manager and we will work through it. Okay? And if we have to do some education of the seller and the seller's attorney, we'll do that. Disclosures. As I said earlier, 80% of all the claims that I see come in the door come out of a non-disclosure or a failure to recommend inspections. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the more recent um, issues that we've gotten. Water shortages. Are we in a drought? Yes. yes. Yes, we are. Okay, so that needs to be disclosed to new buyers that there may be sanctions. I know down in Contra Costa, East Bay, um, East Bay Mud, our water district, uh, is starting rationing July 1. And basically there's going to be huge fines if somebody goes over their ration amounts. <coughs> the ration amounts were set like two years ago. Every water district is different, and you're going to be dealing with a lot of different water districts. And they are going to start fining. So I want to tell you a little story to illustrate this point. So my son is a baseball player, and he had an invitation to go try out at Harvard. So I took him back there over Martin Luther King weekend. I am going something as this. So I'm a foodie too, and so there was a restaurant I had to go to. So the maitre d' told me he could take us at the bar, as long as my son drank milk, which was not a problem, because he's only 16. So we're sitting at the bar, and the bartender turns on the water. Now keep in mind, Boston, are they in a drought? No, they had more snow and water than they know what to do with. So they tur he turns on the faucet and just lets the water run. And my son starts turning red, and he's getting angry, and he's like, look at the water. Oh my god, he's wasting all this water. So then the guy goes back to the kitchen and leaves the water running. And my son by now is climbing over the counter of the bar to turn off the water. He's mortified because he's been raised with a philosophy of protect water, we're in a drought, blah, blah, blah. He's dying. So he finally leans over there, and the guy comes out of the kitchen, and there's my son straddled, by the way, he's six foot two, straddled across the counter and trying to turn off the water. Okay, so this is what I want you to envision. The bartender comes to Sacramento thinking there's no drought or not appreciating the drought that we have here, and he leaves the water running, and then he gets a huge bill. And he says to you, why didn't you tell me this was going on here? I have a case like this right now where a buyer bought a property because of the jungle lush landscape oh. But on a monthly basis, the water bills are $1,250 oh. to maintain that jungle. Oh, Do you think that buyer was happy when he got the first bill and nobody told him that? Oh, no. Okay, so I have given um, Bev, if you don't have it, let me know, a drought advisory that I would like you guys to use, think about using, particularly with buyers that are from out of town who may not understand you know, that we are in a drought and that there are sanctions if we go over it and there could be restrictions. It is a required document, I am just told, so please <laughs> use it. But that's why I want you to use it. Okay, utility bills. I have had cases recently with buyers and sellers complaining about utility bills. That maybe the particular house is you know, computer friendly, is a smart house, um, whatever it happens to be, and has high utility bills. So, although I don't think it's the standard of care, I don't teach to the standard of care, by the way, we teach to the highest level of professionalism. How can you be the best agent that you can possibly be, and how can you be better than everybody else out there? And I think one thing that you can do to help yourself is to get utility bills. Okay? Is it legally required? No. Is it a good practice? Is it helpful to your clients? Yes, it is. So if you're the seller, ask for a couple months copies of utility bills and disclose it to the buyer. 
you're representing a buyer, ask for it as part of the contract. Can I have a month or two months of utility bills? And you will prevent that issue. You will also further educate your buyer, especially if your buyer is moving up to a bigger house and they're not, or a bigger property and they're not expecting that. Or if there is something unique about that property. You know, maybe it's either larger or it's got extensive landscape lighting or something like that that's going to be a little more expensive. Okay, growth houses. I've had a bunch of these cases lately. And a lot of them are tenants. So tenants leasing a property and then growing marijuana out of it and the landlord having no idea. So let me give you an example of one that we just undid. Okay, $2.3 million house. That's, a, that's an expensive house. Okay, so a uh, seller leases it to tenant. $2.3 million house, and they convert it to a growth house. They must have been making a lot of money okay, to be able to justify that. Okay, so tenant moves out, landlord goes in, cleans everything up, markets the property, and resells it. Sells it to a family with two little kids. Okay, so after the, and it says nothing about the history because they thought they had cleaned it all up. Okay, so escrow closes, neighbor comes over and says, Oh, we're so glad that a nice family has moved into the neighborhood and we don't have those tenants growing pot here anymore. Okay, so these people walk back into the house and they go, God, We're smelling a little bit. It does smell a little funny in these carpets. Okay, so they immediately move out, they hire a lawyer, and they want to undo the transaction. They, they're not even willing to live there. They don't want their children there. And I'm looking at this, I represented the agents, by the way, which was a dual agency. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, oh, I don't want this in front of the jury. <laughs> so the seller wound up taking the house back. Wound up taking the house back, the agents wound up paying their commissions back, not normally something we normally do, but unfortunately the agents had knowledge of it. Okay. Now I had another situation, by the way, where um, a person leased out their property. I will. I'm not going to tell you where it is, but leased out a property, and the tenant started growing marijuana. Now the tenant had a card to grow 12 plants. The tenant grew 212 plants. Okay. And the sheriff came in and took all the plants away, but there was a local ordinance which charged the landlord for $1,000 per unauthorized plant. $200,000 bill. The tenant is nowhere to be found and it's a strict liability statute. Oh my goodness. Okay, so what's the moral to these stories? Disclose if it's a growth house, number one. Number two, if you are managing property or you have a landlord, warn them to keep an eye on their property. Okay, because they will be responsible for it even if they don't know what's going on. They are legally charged with knowing what's going on and I get this question all the time from agents. Oh, I have my own property. What do I do with that? Check on it every once in a while. Okay? All right. Man. Along the same vein, no pun intended, men and better mean houses. I really need to say that. <laughs> Okay, so when, you know, there's a statute that says that we have to disclose this. It's mandatory that we disclose this. And when the statute first came out, I kind of blew it off. I'm like, oh, my clients would never sell houses like this. They're not involved in this. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've had these, these come up. Now, this is what I didn't realize. This is a huge cleanup. Like, it involves hazmat teams and the whole nine yards. So let me tell you a little story of one of these that we dealt with. Okay, so agents get a listing and there's tenants there. Thankfully, the agents have the landlord get rid of the tenants. Agents come in after the tenants left and there were needles on the ground. Okay, well, the agents aren't really, don't have a lot of drug knowledge. So they brought in a contractor and they did a junk out. Okay, they cleaned it all up, the contractor took care of it all, took away the needles and everything else. They had it repainted, they had new carpets, everything was good. They listed it on the, on the market. Buyer comes in, makes an offer. Okay, first big red flag, Mrs. Buyer is a lawyer. Okay, so by the way, if you don't want to do business with lawyers, you don't have to do business with lawyers. There was actually a case on that. Okay, so Mrs. Buyer is a lawyer. They make an offer on the property. They do their inspections. Nothing has said about the tenant's drug use. They remove their contingencies. A neighbor comes over while they're there visiting the property prior to the close of escrow and said, did you know what the tenants used to do here? 
Well, then of course they start telling them. Now, Mrs. Byer, Mr. and Mrs. Byer have two little kids. So they're like, hmm, so what do they do? Now, in the contract says you cannot call health officials, they did it anyway. They called the health officials, health officials came in there and found residue on all the walls and condemned the place. So now the seller can't even sell it, can't lease it out, can't do anything with it because it's condemned. But then the seller's angry by now because you're not supposed to call government officials under the contract, right, without the seller's permission. Okay, so now we're stuck. The bill is $50,000 to clean it up. And the seller says, I'm not going to clean it up. You removed your contingencies. And the buyer says, you're selling me an unhated safe house and you didn't disclose the issue. And we got sued too as the listing. We were dual agents. Okay, so how did we solve the problem? Well, we threw in a little bit of our commission. The buyer paid for two, about two-thirds. Seller paid for about a third. We got it all cleaned up, and the buyer signed a release of liability and moved into the property. Okay? But all of that could have been addressed up front, and we could have resolved it without that if we had disclosed what the tenants, what we saw and what the tenants were doing. Okay, so that is something that we need to disclose. Solar leases. How many of you guys are dealing with solar leases? Yeah, it's going to get more and more and more. You know, it used to be that when you had solar, the seller would just buy it. The homeowner would buy the seller, the solar system. And now they've gone to leasing because it's much more affordable. But this is something that we have to deal with as part of the transaction. And I got a call from an agent. The agent called me and said, you know, there was a solar lease on the property. We got a little bit of a problem because it was disclosed, but my buyer didn't do anything about it. And I really didn't know what to do with it. So we close the escrow, and then my buyer gets a $32 bill per month for the, for the solar lease. And I said, okay. And he says, well, he doesn't want to pay it. So now he says, get rid of the solar system. I said, what's the cost of getting rid of the solar system? He says, $75,000. He said, now we've got a problem. I said, yeah, you have a problem. I said, what happened? And he goes, well, I just didn't know how to deal with it, so I didn't. And I just figured the parties would deal with it. Okay. So the contract, the CARRPA, actually makes approval of the solar contracts and systems a contingency of the contract. Okay, so if you are representing a seller and there is a solar system, get copies of the lease, call the solar company or have the sellers to call the solar company, and the solar companies have application forms and a process. It's not that hard. Get those documents. When you have a buyer, or if you are representing a buyer, you need to ask for those documents, and during the inspection period, that buyer needs to apply to the solar company to get approved. I have had it come up where a buyer can buy a house but not be approved by the solar company, okay? Because the solar companies can have more stringent standards because they don't have security, so to speak, okay? So make sure your buyer goes through that process and you put that on your checklist, and we get those approvals before you remove contingencies. Because if the buyer can't get approved, we're going to have to deal with that situation. But it's better to deal with it up front than after the close of escrow when that buyer gets that bill and the solar company hasn't approved the buyer and the seller, you know, the buyer, sub buyer says, I'm not going to pay for this. Yes? And that does something similar, but if they actually purchased it, so there's a $16,000 debt. So I already spoke to the solar uh, company and the company gave me a Okay, so here's, she said that they had actually, the sellers had actually purchased it, the solar system, but there's a $16,000 debt, which I assume will be transferred to the buyer. No, it'll be paid off at escrow. Okay, paid off at escrow. Oh, well, that's good. The transfer will go to uh, all the paperwork, and uh, the uh, buyer will get the benefit of everything that the seller is losing, because now they're, they'll, they'll own it and they'll have the full warranty. Okay, so this is my recommendation to you. Don't make any representations to anybody about what that paperwork says or what it, no, I'm giving you some advice here, or what it does. What I want you to do is give it to the buyer and have, say, go contact the solar company if you have any questions. That's what they told me to do. Okay. Yeah, but I'm just telling you, you've got way too much knowledge for your own good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they need to do that. And if you're the selling agent, by the way, and you receive that, that package, Give it to your buyer with written instructions saying you need to call the solar company to talk to them about this. Okay? Don't read it and interpret it. Yes? How do you deal with the surprise lien on the pre 
protozoan something that swore they would not remain on the rest. Yes. Well, that's between whoever the seller is and the solar company. But quite frankly, if it is on the prelim, that's going to force everybody to deal with it. It's a disclosure. I mean, it becomes a disclosure. It's not on the, not on the original prelim, the first, you know, the first prelim you get from title. It's not there. They sneak it in later. Well, okay. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> the only way that it comes in later is if the solar company gets wind of the transaction and then records it. Because if it's not on the first one, it's just because the title company missed it. Okay, which is possible. Title companies missing, and then they amend title reports, which we're going to talk about title reports in a few minutes. If the, if you don't think that something was properly recorded, then it's between the seller and the title company, or between the seller and the seller company. But quite frankly, I think it's almost a favor that they do record it because that way the buyer can't say you didn't tell me about it. Okay, and it's pretty darn clear that it's it's being disclosed. Well, the seller can't just walk out, can't walk away from it. Right. Yeah, you're right. The seller can't walk away from it. Okay. Boundary line disputes. These seem to be coming up more and more and more. I had a case where the buyer said, especially in rural property, where the buyer said, oh, where's the property line? And I called it the arm waving case. And the agent said, oh, right here. Right here. Okay. It turns out that the two neighbors' houses were actually encroaching onto the property. Okay, over the property lines. And the agent's the one that made the representation. Oh, don't worry about the property lines, they're right here. We paid some money on that case. Okay, so boundary line disputes. If you see a fence, it may not be on the property line. Don't assume it's on the property line. If your seller tells you, I don't know where the property lines are, have them disclose that on the TDS. Seller is unaware of the property lines. If a buyer is concerned about the property lines or there's any question about the property lines, have them get a survey. You know, I love the fact, you know, surveys are expensive. I'll admit it. You know, they're somewhere around $1,000, $1,200, depending on the property. But this is the greatest investment that these buyers are ever going to make in their life. And they're spending many times hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. And they won't spend the money to have a survey to figure out what the property lines are. But they're willing to pay 20 times that for a lawyer when they find out that the property line is not where they thought it was. Okay? So recommend that. If they choose not to do it, that's on them. But this seems to be an area that is coming up more and more. Okay, cockroaches. Kind of gross, but we've had cockroach cases. Insects, rodents, bed bugs. Have bed bug cases too. It has to be disclosed. And one tip, ask your sellers when you're taking a listing, do you have pest extermination contract? You know, a lot of people have them on a monthly basis. I have one, not because I've got a pest problem, but because I don't want a pest problem. So some people do it, but here's the problem. A buyer moves in, and then they get cockroaches, and then they find out later that the seller has a monthly extermination contract, and they immediately say, well, you have that contract because you had a cockroach problem, and you didn't tell me about the cockroaches. Okay, even though there's no correlation, it is helpful to disclose this is, you know, my seller has uses Terminex on a monthly basis. If you got any questions, call Terminex. Okay? Gross. Okay. Incomplete disclosures. This has come up um, across the board with many files I've looked at, and I'm going to be candid with you, several Remax files I've looked at. And I want you to keep in mind that when I see a file, that means things aren't going well. Okay. I don't see perfect files with perfect transactions that close and there's no problems. I only see the files where there's a problem. And one trend I have noticed is that some of the disclosures are not complete. Let me give you some examples. Some of the questions on the TDS are incomplete. Some of the questions on the SPQ are incomplete. Blanks. Okay, now, by the way, under the new contract, the SPQ is required. It's not optional anymore. Under the RPA, it's required. I do think, as a listing agent, you need to look at the disclosures and make sure they're complete. Is every box marked? If there is a necessary explanation, is it there? So is there a yes and they're supposed to describe it? Is there no explanation there? I do think that the standard of care is that as a listing agent, you need to look at your seller's disclosures. As a selling agent, you need to look at the disclosures. If it's incomplete, send it back to the seller. 
Send it back to the listing agent. Say this is incomplete. We need to fix it. Now let me give you. Let me tell you a little war story to illustrate this point. Um, the second largest settlement I ever recommended, and that they paid, came out of incomplete disclosures. So this is what happened, and this is the second largest uh, uh, recommendation I've made in 25 years. So that probably tells you the magnitude of this. Okay, so buyers make an offer to buy some property. Sellers give them a TDS, SPQ. The questions regarding drainage and flooding and grading are all left blank on the TDS <laughs> and on the SPQ. Oh my. Nobody noticed. Jeez. Okay, so buyers buy the property. Nobody noticed, nobody said anything. I had the listing agent. Selling agent didn't ask any questions. Nobody did anything. We closed escrow. The next big rain, the house slides down the hill into a gully, into a valley down the hill, and it's red tech. This two-story beautiful house, red tech, nobody could live there. Okay, so the buyers go back a couple days later to take a look, and they notice that there's part of a retaining wall that's still there, and it's suspended in midair. And behind it is a telephone pole holding it up. I don't have to make this up. You guys give me great stuff. Okay, I'm holding it up. So the buyers called the seller and said, why is there a telephone pole behind the wall? And they said, oh, because the wall was sliding down the hill and we put the telephone pole there to stop it. Okay, none of which was disclosed or seen or, or in anything, nothing. Okay, so the buyers, of course, hire a lawyer and sue. By the time the lawsuit gets filed, the sellers are divorced. One's on disability and one's in bankruptcy. So they are no insurance. They're no good. So we're stuck with this lawsuit between the listing agent and the selling agent. So I said to my listing agent, why didn't you look at the TDS? Did you notice that it's blank? And she said, no, I was just too busy. Uh, and I said, OK, I'm going to be presenting this case in front of a jury. Your commission was $35,000 in this transaction. Some of those jurors make $35,000 in a year. I cannot explain to them that in one transaction for which you were paid $35,000, you were too busy to notice the most important disclosure document in, that, that gets provided. Yikes. Wow. So we wound up settling the case, forced well into the six figures. Big, big settlement, and so did the selling agent. She paid the exact same that we did. Actually, she paid a little bit more than what the listing agent paid. Um, the moral to the story is, I do think you have an obligation to look at the disclosures. If they are incomplete or they don't make sense to you, and you're representing a buyer, send them back. If you're representing the seller, look at them and give them back to the seller and say, clarify this. Because I want you to understand something. The TDS is your friend. Okay? It is the seller's friend. The TDS actually, and I'm probably digressing way too much, but I want you to understand how important this is. The transfer disclosure statement was actually put forth to the legislature by CAR in the late 1980s. The reason it was put before CAR is because of a case called Easton, which came out of the Bay Area, and it was a non-disclosure case. But here was the philosophy. Prior to the TDS, the seller would say, oh, I've got these problems. Okay? And the buyer would close escrow and later say, you never told me. And the seller would say, yes, I told you. And there would be no proof of it. Or the seller would say, I told my agent. And you would say, yes, I told you this buyer. And the buyer would say, no, you didn't. Okay? And it was all a huge he said, she said kind of a thing. Okay, now we have a document where the seller in their own handwriting has to disclose everything they know about the property. That's like your biggest friend. So make sure that it's complete and it's properly done. I have a question about that. Yeah. I'm pretty much a stickler when we get disclosures. We check to make sure that every box is checked, that every yes answer has an explanation. Um, and a, I would say 75% of the time we send the disclosures back asking for more clarification that the boxes mm -hmm. be checked. And it's very difficult to get the seller's agent to um, get that information for us. Do you have any suggestions on, on how to proceed? Okay, so the question is, she said 75%, which tells you how relevant this conversation is, of the disclosures that she receives are incomplete or ambiguous enough that you have further questions on. When you send them to the listing agent, the listing agent has a difficult time. Is the listing agent the one that's causing a problem, or is it the seller themselves? I don't, you don't you know. know. Okay, so as far as if it's the agent themselves, you can always have manager talk to manager. So your manager talk to their manager and see if you can't. Because quite frankly, it protects everybody. Okay, so that's one avenue. 
If the seller is being difficult, then I think what you have to do is paper your file. So you've got to show the emails. I'm following up on these disclosures. I'm following up. I'm following up. And if they absolutely refuse to give them to you, then you need to make sure you cancel your buyer. These disclosures are incomplete. And I want this in writing. These disclosures are incomplete. We have asked it numerous times for completion and further clarification, and the seller's not providing it. How would you like to handle this? Do you want to move forward with the transaction, or would you prefer to cancel the transaction knowing that the seller is, I mean, there could be issues when the seller's not cooperating with disclosures. That is a red flag, right? But the bottom line is that your job is to make sure that you educate the buyer and you give the buyer their options. And if the buyer says, no, this is a risk I'm willing to undertake because I've done all my inspections and I'm comfortable with the property, that's their choice. I just want to make sure that you've documented your file that you've done your job. Yeah. With that, would you then uh, submit a notice to perform prior to cancellation in that case or just cancel? Well, it's hard for me. The question was, should you issue a notice to perform? It depends on what the issues are. So, you know, if they contend the TDS is complete, then I'm not sure you can issue a notice to perform because what are you asking them to perform? You're asking for further clarification, which is an additional question. Now, if they haven't provided like it, there's big blanks, then you would issue a notice to perform because the contract says as part of the disclosures, the seller is obligated to provide a complete TDS. So I'm going to give you a lawyer's answer, and that is it depends. <laughs> can I ask one last question yeah. going back to the TDS that related to what we're talking about right now? Um, the young lady back here uh, brought up the issue of them being able to check the TDS rather than fill out the AVID. If they check Which we're not going to ever do. Right. But my question is, what happens when we're on the buyer's side and we receive that? Is there anything we can do to further no. protect ourselves as the buyer's agent? No. I mean, you can't force a listing agent to do an AVID to do an out, as long as they fill out their part of the TDS. You can't force the other side. It's a red flag as to who you're dealing with, though, by the way, that you're not dealing with somebody that's as well trained as you guys, or has the kind of same kind of standards. Yeah? You just sort of document it. Send an email requesting better information. You can, yeah. Question? Yeah. Wave it. The arm waver. <laughs> Okay, um, the question was, what is my position on the TDS and the SPQ and having a line drawn through it and exempt? Um, if a property, I advocate it, I support it, if the property is truly exempt, so let's say it's a foreclosure REL that's being resold and a TDS is not required, I tell, or it's a trust sale or a probate sale where it's not required, by the way, on an REO, you're still going to have to do your AVIDs, okay? Just keep that in mind. Just because they don't have to do their TDS doesn't mean you don't have to do your AVID. You still have to do it. So if you are selling a property that's, let's say, an REO, and it's per foreclosure and you're selling for the lender, they are not required to do a TDS. I do recommend that you take a TDS out, you draw a line through it, and you write exempt, and you have the buyer sign off on that. Why? Two reasons. Number one, I think that's a disclosure in and of itself. And on the third page, you're still going to write C attached AVID, so you're still going to need it you know, for your agent disclosure. If you are selling a property that is exempt, because let's say that it's pursuant to a trust where you know, the owner has died and the son is selling it, they still have to disclose everything that they know about the property, even though they don't have to fill out a TDS. Now, in that circumstance, I don't recommend that trustees fill out a, tr fill out a TDS because they may be guessing on some of the questions. And then if there's something that arguably they should have known and they mark the box no and they should have known yes, it gets them into trouble. But on the other hand, they need to attach an addendum and write down anything that they do have personal knowledge of. So let's say that you've got a son and that son has been managing a property for his you know, senior mother, elderly mother for the last three years. Well, he may know about the drainage repairs, the roof leaks, et cetera. He has to disclose that. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes. Probably with a whole lot more. Okay, yes? Just to eliminate all the problems with disclosures, what I do is when I take the listing, I have all the disclosures ready for my clients to fill up after we do the listing agreement. We sit down side by side. I just did that about five days ago. And then they, they fill out all the disclosures while I'm looking at it, and I tell them to read it out loud if they have any questions. 
And then I said, you know, they answer everything with their handwriting.